In September 2019, American scientists from the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory published an alarming report on climate change in the Engineering and Technology Management Journal. It concerns the rate of methane going into the atmosphere from permafrosts in the Arctic region. Corroborating predictions of methane bursts in the next few decades, scientists have detected an unexpected rise in methane emissions near Barrow, Alaska. As the report stated, a record-breaking level in methane was observed at the Alaskan research site. This unprecedented emission has the scientists worried. It shows that a much larger methane burst is imminent and will commence sooner than expected, and it will not be the last. Partly due to an accelerated warming of the planet from man-made carbon dioxide emissions, causing more of the permafrosts in the Arctic region to thaw out, but also by hydraulic fracturing or fracking by companies driven to make a profit from selling underground oil and gas, it would appear that we are at the cusp of a new and dangerous era. Why is methane so dangerous? It is all because of the fact that methane is a major greenhouse gas. Just one molecule of methane can warm the planet at least 22 times greater than a single molecule of carbon dioxide. The emission of enough methane into the atmosphere is so dangerous that some prominent scientists believe a major methane burst would cause a collapse of the biosphere. If that occurs, global economic systems would face a catastrophic recession the likes of which we may never recover from within the next 10 years. Of course, the Earth has experienced methane bursts in the past and life on Earth has survived. This is because life has benefited from the colder conditions of an ice age and there were enough trees to provide protection from the sun and heat. A rise of at least 8 degrees Celsius at the end of the last ice age through methane emissions nearly 11,000 years ago was just right for us. While humans have adapted to the change, humanity today is facing another methane burst. However, this time, we are no longer in an ice age and we have cleared away many trees in various parts of the world. To address this world problem, a number of solutions have emerged. These include growing seaweed to absorb the carbon dioxide dissolved in the oceans, growing more trees to absorb the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, storing fresh water in underground tanks to minimize evaporation, and building desalination plants along the coast near desert areas to transform the land into a plant-rich and productive environment. Recycling food wastes and using the methane generated to power transport vehicles. Using wind, solar and geothermal energy generation to produce recyclable electricity. Ending our dependency on fossil fuels to meet our transportation needs and using electricity instead. Speaking of transportation vehicles, there is a little known concept in electromagnetism with a little careful thinking and application of the right engineering solutions that can eliminate fossil fuels altogether. First proposed by Max Abraham in 1905 with additional insights from Hendrik Lorentz, the concept is known as the radiation reaction force and the mathematical equation for describing this force is called the Abraham-Lorentz formula. The theory is considered controversial because physicists are not sure whether the radiation reaction force occurs in reality. Even more surprisingly, no experiments have been conducted to find out because no one knows how to emit radiation in one direction from a charged object. Not to mention whether the radiation has enough force to achieve this moving of solid matter effect. More importantly, the controversy extends to what the solution is suggesting to us. With no other known energy sources, it suggests electromagnetic energy from the emitted radiation can be recycled. Not only that, but the solution also reveals a remarkable exponential acceleration. As scientists remain unsure about this formula, a little-known American physicist has patented in the 1950s an electromagnetic device that has provided the important clue needed to explain how we can test the concept. And indeed, 
he claimed to have observed an unusual form of acceleration after reaching a critical charge or voltage and frequency of the radiation. Then in 1929, Albert Einstein revealed in his unified field theory the existence of a gravitational field in the electromagnetic field. Assuming the radiation is moving only the uncharged component of solid matter, mainly the mass from atoms, it would appear from the unified field equations that there is a way to amplify the gravitational field in the radiation using the charge and frequency of the oscillating charge and hence the oscillating radiation. If the charge and or frequency is high enough, the gravitational field can be strong enough to bend the radiation back on itself. Actually, this is the definition of energy recycling. While physicists are still debating the reality of this concept, what if we told you the technology has already been implemented and is in use, and that people have been witnessing the technology in airborne vehicles for a long time? and that one of these vehicles was retrieved in the late 1940s by a military organization which has kept the technology to itself, irrespective of the dangerous climate change problem we are facing today. On the night of July 2nd, 1947, a UFO was struck down by lightning and crashed in the New Mexico desert. The following morning, the main body of the craft and crew were picked up by the U.S. Army not far from Socorro. Four days later, materials blown out of the craft by the lightning bolt were picked up by the U.S. Air Force on a rancher's property, together with additional crew members that fell out of the craft. On July 7, 1947, Lieutenant General Nathan Twining suddenly changed his travel plans to attend a matter of utmost importance in New Mexico. This is confirmed by this July 17, 1947 letter from Twining to Mr. Eric Schaefer of the Boeing Airplane Company, as well as directly by the Air Force, which has since downplayed the event as a routine visit. Following the visit, a document from Twining dated July 15, 1947, has provided details of a preliminary examination of a flying disc recovered in New Mexico. The report explained some of the internal aspects of the disc and the electromagnetic effects the disc could perform. The words used in the report to describe the flying disc include, the craft itself comprises the propulsion system, the reactor to function as a heat exchanger and permitting the storage of energy into a substance for later use, storage battery, no moving parts discernible within the power room. The activation of an electrical potential is believed to be the primary power to the reactor. The air outside would be ionized. Crew compartments were hermetically sealed via a solidification process. No weld marks, rivets, or soldered joints. Craft components appear to be molded and pressed into perfect fit. The first the public learns of an electromagnetic technology in UFOs comes from an anonymous magnetic science expert mentioned in Frank Scully's Behind the Flying Saucers in 1950. Apart from operating on electromagnetic principles, it was claimed that the flying disc was constructed to follow these principles, such as the very smooth outer metal surface, Any separate metal components on the exterior must touch and provide a perfect fit to other external metal components. In other words, there were no sharp edges or points on the outside of the disc. Portholes in the door were set flush and smooth. When the door is closed, you could no longer see where the door was as it simply became part of the exterior hull. Then there are the electromagnetic effects when the flying disc was in operation. This fact was noted of other UFOs by Professor James McDonald, an atmospheric physicist. During a speech on June 7, 1967, he said, A wide range of electromagnetic disturbances accompanying close passage or hovering of the UFOs is now on record throughout the world.
disturbance of internal combustion engines coincident with close passage of disc-like or cylindrical unconventional objects is on record in at least several hundred instances. Often the disturbances are accompanied by broad-spectrum electromagnetic noise picked up on radio devices. From all over the world, wherever the day's headlines are made, Headline Edition brings you accurate, timely... In many instances, compasses, both on ships and in aircraft, have been disturbed. Magnetometers and even wristwatches have been affected. All these reports, far too numerous to cite in detail, point to some kind of electromagnetic noise or electromagnetic side effects. Even Project Blue Book's first director, Captain Edward Ruppelt, could not help notice the electromagnetic effects that were showing up in a growing number of genuine UFO reports. He said, during my tenure with Project Blue Book, we had reports of radiation and induction fields in connection with UFOs. However, the information was sketchy and we were never able to pin it down. The reports of electromagnetic disturbances characterized a whole new dimension to On the UFO investigation. The U.S. government quickly changed the aim of Project Blue Book in an attempt to convince the public that UFOs were merely misidentifications of man-made and natural objects. Under no circumstances would the government concede the possibility of something alien in the UFO reports. It was enough to force Ruppelt to retire from the Air Force under protest. <laughs> McDonald and Ruppelt were not alone on this matter. Canadian radio engineer Dr. Wilbert Smith of the Department of Transport in Ottawa noticed the electromagnetic nature of UFOs after reading Scully's book and a number of UFO reports. Smith recommended a study into UFOs to his government using this document. The Canadian government agreed. The project commenced in December 1950 and went under the auspicious name of Project Magnet. The aim of the study was to find the electromagnetic principles that might be employed by UFOs and why. Part of the work also involved setting up instruments in a wooden hut to measure electromagnetic and gravitational fields of UFOs as they flew within range. Even though one significant reading on all instruments was measured on the afternoon of August 8, 1954, during a foggy day showing that something had flown overhead, the U.S. government heard about the project and felt it was necessary to encourage the Canadian authorities not to pursue the evidence and the project itself for some unspecified reason. Happy to talk the walk to the Canadians, the U.S. government would do the opposite by instigating major secret projects into advanced and controversial electromagnetic concepts in the 1950s. The projects included Albert Einstein's unified field theory linking gravity with the electromagnetic field from 1955. And, with direct involvement from the U.S. Air Force, 
the U.S. government investigated the concept known as the Radiation Reaction Force in 1959. This is the concept that looks at charged objects emitting radiation and how the mathematical solution reveals an astonishing exponential acceleration effect. While physicists debate the reality of this type of acceleration to this day, Thomas Townsend Brown, an American physicist and inventor, was close to working out the technological secret to how UFOs move through his patented asymmetric capacitor device. Here are several examples of his device. When the device is charged, the inventor observed an unusual non-uniform acceleration when given a sufficient oscillating voltage, a kind of runaway acceleration effect at a fixed and critical voltage level that forced him to reduce the voltage to prevent his device from flying away. However, the inventor faced many setbacks, as if someone knew the importance of his work and did not want him to succeed. With no support from the U.S. government and no satisfactory explanation for why his device moved, he was never able to complete his work and solve the UFO mystery before his death on October 27, 1985. The bad luck also reached Professor Morris Jessup, who was found dead in his car under suspicious circumstances in 1959. At the time, Jessup was on the verge of discovering the secret behind Einstein's unified field theory. As Dr. J. Manson Valentine remembered from his discussions with his colleague Jessup in 1959, an electric field created in a coil induces a magnetic field at right angles to the first. Each of these fields represents one plane of space. But since there are three planes of space, there must be a third field, perhaps a gravitational one. By hooking up electromagnetic generators so as to produce a magnetic pulse, it might be possible to produce this third field. In other words, a pulsing magnetic field creates an oscillating electromagnetic field or radiation. Therefore, the concept behind Einstein's unified field theory is that radiation generates a gravitational field. It wasn't simply the fact that radiation could render objects invisible using its own gravitational field, as was the aim of Jessup's work in understanding the U.S. Navy's secret experiment on invisibility. There were other implications. Number one, gravity is likely to have an electromagnetic explanation. This must involve radiation pressure and the application of the radiation shielding effect of matter to affect the pressure over one end of an object compared to the opposite end that receives the universal background radiation. Number two, radiation is the key to explaining how UFOs move. Number three, the use of radiation to propel the UFOs can render the objects invisible in a periodic way. Could this be the reason for Jessup's untimely death and why the U.S. government is determined to maintain UFO secrecy to this day, including the very nature of the crashed disk in New Mexico? To give an indication of just how sensitive the whole UFO matter is to the U.S. government, a similar fate may also have befallen U.S. President John F. Kennedy. On 12 November 1963, in an attempt to end the Cold War with Russia, Kennedy wrote a secret memo to the CIA director requesting that all UFO information be released to NASA and his Russian counterparts. Ten days later, Kennedy was assassinated. Leaving aside the controversy of who killed the president, there is also a question of why it happened. There is one very good reason. Although not willing to admit it, we know the CIA is actively engaged in gathering UFO information. Documents released under Freedom of Information in 1976 shows the considerable interest the CIA has in this subject and remains so to this day. Furthermore, the CIA is willing to do anything to protect the national interests of the nation and maintain security and secrecy, even if it means eliminating individuals or groups abroad or in the United States. 
For example, the CIA has used the Mafia, together with assistance from Cuban exiles, in a failed attempt on April 17, 1961, to overthrow the Cuban leader in the Bay of Pigs fiasco. As people learn more about the UFO memo and can see a motive for the CIA to have the president taken out, in November 2018, the CIA released documents showing the organization has been gathering all possible explanations for what happened and why, with a special emphasis on blaming Lee Harvey Oswald, of course. Yet remarkably, even with the UFO memo from Kennedy, the CIA has somehow overlooked this important document. Was this a matter of convenience? Or was it too close to the truth? Either that, or the CIA is not capable of doing its job of gathering all documents on the matter properly. Whatever we might think happened on the day, it is clear the CIA was faced with a dangerous president willing to seek the truth and be seen as a great leader among his people in solving world problems. The release of UFO information could easily have been the thing that broke the camel's back, so to speak, for an organization desperate to maintain the status quo. There is absolutely no reason why the CIA could not be responsible for what happened to Kennedy. Interestingly, to this day, the UFO memo was never acted upon. UFOs remain one of the most, if not the most, sensitive subject within the U.S. government. Following this important event, everything went quiet. The results of all this work by the U.S. government in electromagnetism and why UFOs are top secret would On December 29, 1980, in the state of Texas, the U.S. military carried out the world's first test of a glowing diamond-shaped UFO, complete with three unsuspecting civilian witnesses looking on. All three witnesses suffered radiation poisoning from the encounter. Today, we can explain why. The UFO carried an oscillating electric charge on its metal surface. The high amounts of electrons flowing on the surface to make it glow at high temperatures like an electric light bulb were ejected at high speeds in all directions. A number of the electrons hit the stainless steel car body, which in turn emitted ionizing X-rays. The UFO was surrounded and escorted by numerous black unmarked single-rotor and double-rotor CH-47 Chinook helicopters to a nearby military base. Despite the obvious military presence in the testing, the USAF successfully avoided paying compensation to the witnesses because no direct proof was found that the USAF had owned the UFO. Therefore, it was not responsible for the health effects. Even if this could be true, the military was unable to give an explanation of how the witnesses could have suffered the radiation poisoning effects based on their observations. Following the court case, the USAF quickly moved its testing to a secret military base in the Nevada desert known as Area 51 in the hope that no one would notice anything. Unfortunately for the military, the public has continued to observe unusual glowing flying objects over the base from a distance. And as if the military is struggling to keep its work on UFOs and the electromagnetic technology a secret, numerous other witnesses continue to experience radiation effects and observe UFOs to this day. Here are examples of UFOs that have left behind traces on witnesses and the environment. If the military claims it is not responsible for such observations, then who else could be flying these UFOs? And can we truly say that there is absolutely nothing in the UFO reports to study? Obviously, those witnesses who have been affected certainly think UFOs are a subject worthy of proper scientific study. As NASA aerospace engineer John Schussler said after reviewing the Cash Landrum UFO case, this is a very important case providing physical evidence of the existence of UFOs. A radiologist who examined the women's records said they were apparently suffering from the symptoms of radiation poisoning. Despite commentary like this, 
The USAF is uncharacteristically non-inquisitive about the matter, as if it knows why. At the present time, the USAF wants the public to believe that UFOs are nothing out of the ordinary and do not represent anything new to science. Whatever witnesses have seen or suffered should be accepted as a normal part of human life. The decision for the military to see UFOs in this way stems partly from the need to protect the electromagnetic technology it has uncovered in 1947 and partly from the decision made by the scientists that headed the University of Colorado's UFO study in 1969, Dr. Edward Condon. As Condon concluded in his report, our general conclusion is that nothing has come from the study of UFOs in the past 21 years that has added to scientific knowledge. Careful consideration of the record as it is available to us leads us to conclude that further extensive study of UFOs probably cannot be justified in the expectation that science will be advanced thereby. This was an understandable conclusion since the USAF was not particularly keen to release the evidence it had acquired for scientific evaluation. Yet, despite the conclusions from the 1969 scientific report, a compilation and careful analysis of the UFO observations has revealed a simple electromagnetic technology lying at the core of genuine UFO reports. Indeed, there are enough reports on record to show that whoever or whatever is flying these objects is trying very hard to demonstrate the technology to us as if we might be able to understand the technology for ourselves. For example, we know some UFOs want to demonstrate their ability to spiral in the air like an electron moving around a magnetic field line. When magnetic lines converge around what is described as the North and South Poles, UFOs can reveal the behavior of an electron moving side to side between these poles and drifting away. In this UFO example, we observe the way the emitted radiation from the UFO can move solid matter, in this case, one of the witnesses. As for this UFO occupant observed in Argentina, he was apparently happy to demonstrate his understanding of gravity by defying the gravitational effect through a floating metal ball in his hand. This quote is also interesting because it suggests that whoever and whatever is flying this UFO wants to demonstrate the effect of a bright glow at its rear and the subsequent rapid acceleration that takes place for a short distance before repeating the process in the opposite direction. And what about this quote? Here we have an unusual flight behavior of a UFO as if someone is trying to tell us that the energy being emitted is oscillating, thus making the UFO move in a sinusoidal manner. The USAF knows about the electromagnetic technology. It has hidden the evidence from the public since 1947. And as we have seen, it has figured out how the technology moves and has been testing its own version in front of some civilian witnesses. If anyone should know the answer to the UFO problem and what these objects are, the USAF would be the ones to ask. Even without the help of the military, there are enough witnesses who have seen and experienced the electromagnetic effects as revealed by the UFO reports. In fact, we now have enough reports to determine the precise electromagnetic concept behind UFOs. At this present time, we know what the electromagnetic technology is. More importantly, with the threat of climate change looming, any new technology to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels for man-made aircraft and rocket technology must be seen as beneficial for humankind. As The Guardian stated, Planes currently account for more global warming than all the cars on the world's roads. And a scientific article, written and published in 2010 by scientists from Norway's Center for International Climate and Environmental Research and Austria's International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis stated, per passenger hour traveled, however, aviation's climate impact is a factor 6 to 47 times higher than the impact from car travel. 
As the Twining document has shown, the USAF knows about the electromagnetic technology. Furthermore, the technology appears to have no fuel tank and combustion engine. It appears the technology has a way of extracting electromagnetic energy from the surrounding environment and keeping its storage of energy topped up during operation. The time has come for the technology to be revealed and to end the UFO secrecy. We can either do this through one simple experiment based on the American physicist's patented electromagnetic device, or we get a congressional hearing to bring out the evidence that has been kept by the USAF after all this time. To learn more about the new electromagnetic technology, feel free to purchase this book. It will be the book that will challenge the accepted scientific view and question the USAF's official public stance on UFOs.